if somebody walked up to us and said, hey, we've got an Ethernet network, we'd say, congratulations, great. It, uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, it could mean that they're running anything from 10 megabits per second to 40 gigabits per second. It could mean that they're running fiber optic cabling with a variety of termination points and you know SFPs that they're using, or it could be running on copper with unshielded twisted pair, or even <laughs> or even going back a couple decades, they could be running it on coax with 10 base 2. So in this video, I'd like to chat with you about some of the terminologies in this big world that we call Ethernet. And just as a reminder of where we are in the TCP IP protocol stack, as we're focusing on Ethernet, we're focusing right here on the physical aspects regarding Ethernet. And also, we'll have a separate set of videos just on Ethernet standards with things like VLANs and trunking, which we'll get into the data link layer. But for this discussion, we're still staying at the physical layer. So regarding Ethernet, there are two major options that we have. And one is to use copper, and the other is to use fiber. And we've had several examples of each of those up to this point. And when using Ethernet with copper with unshielded twisted pair, which is our primary method of implementing Ethernet networking today, and normally we have RJ45 connectors. Although if we're getting our internet delivered with DSL, we could have RJ11 connectors, that's the phone lines, that go into our DSL modem device. Or if we have our internet delivered via cable modem service, that'd be coax cable, and that'd be using RG6. And then the cable modem would need to be DOCSIS compliant which represents a set of standards used for cable modem. And let me clear up my RG6 a little bit so it looks like RG6. So here we go, RG6, and that is cable, coax cable. And while we're talking about copper, one other option I didn't mention earlier, and I wanna mention now, is twin X. So with coax, we have one major conductor inside the cable for the signals to be sent. And with twin X, we have two. So that's yet another option for delivering data over copper. So if we were using TwinX, we'd have to have the appropriate SFP that interfaces with the TwinX cable and also with our networking gear so that our gear with that SFP can connect to that media. All right, so let me clean that up a little bit. And I want to focus on some of the terminology with copper. And just for a little history here with Ethernet, uh, my first exposure to it was 10 base 2. So the 10 represents the speed, 10 megabits per second. Base represents baseband. Effectively, there's only one frequency of signals going on at a time on that network. And the two represents approximately 200 meters, which is the length, the overall length of that coax based network. But having that decode of what that means also is gonna help us with the current standards today. For example, if we were using a 10 megabit ethernet and we were using a switch, that would be called 10 base T, and that T represents twisted pair. And when we're talking about categories five and six of twisted pair, that would also represent unshielded twisted pair. And then as time went on, there was 100 base T, and it's actually called TX, which also used unshielded twisted pair. And so one of those pairs is used for sending data and the other pair is used for receiving data. So you could have basically a full highway in both directions between a network device like a PC or a printer or a server and the switch. And they refer to that as running full duplex. So this could be referred to as just ethernet. This could be referred to as fast ethernet. And then as we go to one gigabit or 1000 megabits per second, and that would be 1000 base TX, and no one's gonna make too much fun of you if you leave off the X, but 1000 refers to 1000 megabits per second, which we also know and refer to as gigabit ethernet. And once again, using unshielded twisted pair. And then as technology increases and as our gear supports it, we have additional options like 10 gigabits per second, 10G base T, again, using twisted pair. But now we have to be very careful to make sure we're using the right category of cable. And that includes the patch panels, the jacks, and everything else that's between the computer and the actual switch that's trying to get 10 gig. And then as time goes on, we have 40 gig. 40 gig base T. And as we start to get up in this 40 gig range, if we start using CAT7 and CAT8 cabling, uh, that is going to be shielded. All right, so let me clean that up just a little bit and let's talk about some of the uh, standards for cabling in the world of fiber. Now we already know from our previous discussion that we have multi-mode fiber and single mode fiber and that multi-mode has a larger diameter. And so the signal gets bounced around inside of that and doesn't go quite as far as single mode fiber. So with these technologies, uh, up to 10 gig anyway, 
we pretty much have 100 meters as our maximum run. And then with multi-mode, we can go like 500 meters, again, depending on the application. And with single mode, like closer to 5,000 meters, which is, you know, a long way. Now for fiber, the actual names are very similar, except we're not going to have T's in there because we don't actually do it over twisted pair. We do it over fiber optic cabling. So some commonalities would be, for example, 100 base or 1000 base, which could also be written as one gig base, or as the speeds go up, 10 gig base. And then for the extensions, it's going to depend on the type of signals that we're going to be using, including the SFPs involved as we use that media. So some of the options for these could include the extensions of FX. And when I see FX, I just think of fiber or SX. And when I think of S, I think of short, and relatively short compared to L, which I think of as long. So these are some shortcuts to help remember just the general concepts regarding Ethernet standards for fiber. F, if you see that, that's fiber. That wouldn't be copper-based, that'd be fiber-based. If it's S, that's for the shorter, very likely multi-mode. L is for longer. And there's a few flavors of each of those. There's also SR and LR. And either way, the S, I think of it as the shorter length. As an example, 500 meters compared to LR, which would be more like 5,000 meters. And that's just a short list of some of those extensions. But the point I want to make here is that when we're looking at Ethernet, we're looking at 10 or 100 or 1 gig or 10 gig or higher. And the biggest difference is, is that with copper, we're using unshielded twisted pair. Or in the case of the higher categories of cable, we may indeed be using some shielded twisted pair. And then with fiber, we're using fiber optic cabling, which is going to boil down to some flavor of multi-mode or single mode fiber, depending on our application. And we can recognize those standards if they have any of these extensions after them. And even though I stopped writing it out at 10 gig here, there's also 50 gig and 100 gig and 200 gig fiber. And that, my friend, is a whole bunch of throughput. And I'd also like to talk about one additional option that we have with fiber, which we currently don't implement with copper, and that is leveraging multiple different frequencies in the case of fiber, that'd be light frequencies, on the same cable. So here's an example. Instead of having a pair of fiber cables, one for sending and one for receiving, what we could do is have one cable and then use that one cable and then use different frequencies, one for sending, one for receiving, and accomplish the same results. Now, to pull that off, we have to have the transceivers and the SFPs and the gear that support it. And some of the technologies that are used to actually implement multiple frequencies on the same cable would include technologies like CWDM, which is an acronym for Coarse Wavelength Division Multiplexing. And just like the word multitasking means doing multiple things at the same time, multiplexing refers to sending multiple signals at the same time. But think of it like two flashlights, uh, a green flashlight and a red flashlight. <laughs> Maybe that's not a great example because if you combine those, they would make a different color like purple or something. But in the case of multiplexing with signals, we're using frequency A, for example, for sending and frequency B for receiving. And CWDM is one way of pulling that off. Another option is DWDM. So the wavelength division multiplexing the same, except the D stands for dense. And one of the reasons for choosing one over the other would be how much throughput do you need? So CWDM could be great for applications that need like 10 gigabits per second. And DWDM could do like 100 gigabits per second. So it depends on the application and the budget and how much data needs to be moved. And for this trick right here, using a single fiber and being able to send and receive at the same time, the trick they're going to use to pull that off is called bidirectional wavelength division multiplexing, which is pretty darn cool. So a service provider, if they needed to move a lot of data inside their network on behalf of their customers, and they needed to move it fairly long distances by using fiber for their Ethernet networks and using technologies like dense wavelength division multiplexing, they can forward a ton of data through their networks. So thanks for joining me in this set of videos and content regarding cables and connectors in the world of Ethernet with copper and fiber. And I look forward to seeing you, my friend, in the very next set of videos. Until then, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey, thanks for watching and subscribe right here to get the latest information from CBT Nuggets. And if you're new to or considering a career in the world of IT, head on over to CBT Nuggets and sign up for a free trial.